Heavenly Father, as children saved by grace, as wretches that you have converted and made your bride, we sit here this morning and recognize that the relationship that you have blessed us with you, that this incredible, intimate love relationship that you have entered into with us is truly indescribable. And as we think about that, Lord, and, and we attempt to contemplate that this morning, to get a picture of this incredible relationship that you have given us with your Son, we ask, Father, that you would enable us by the power of your Spirit to see it clearly, to see it in all of its beauty and its wonder and its glory and its magnificence. Hold nothing back from us, Lord. Let us get a glimpse of the way that it is supposed to be, of what it truly means to be in love with you. Lord, please cause us to see that, cause us to long for that. If we don't have that right now, Lord, please, by your grace, show us this morning why it is we don't have that. Show us what foxes have gotten into our vineyard and are spoiling it for us. And Lord, through the power of Christ, let us rid our vineyard, our relationship with you, of all of the things that have threatened and endangered our love relationship with you. It is too precious, Lord. It is too valuable to let it be spoiled by these little things. Please compel us and motivate us by the power of your spirit to know what these things are in our hearts and to get rid of them by your grace. All of this, Lord, we know is absolutely impossible for us to do. The only reason we even have this relationship with you is because of your grace, and the only reason it will blossom and bloom in the ways that you want it to is going to be by your grace. And so, Lord, we, we come to you and, and ask you and plead with you to do this for us. Do it for your own glory, and do it out of your love for us, Surely this is what is best for us. This is what we were made for. This is best for our church. This is best for all those around us. Lord, there's no reason for you not to do this. So please, help us to have this kind of, have this kind of head over heels love for you again. Lord, this is our prayer. Help me to be able to, to preach this passage well, to apply your word to all of our hearts. Lord, again, this is only possible by your Spirit, and by your Spirit, help us to listen and to receive it and to be changed by it in the ways that you want for your own glory. Amen. Good morning. morning. It's so good to be with you all again. I was talking with Vern before the service about how it's truly such a privilege to to get to preach um, from God's Word to you. And I know that that's something that is is common for us to say before we we begin a sermon, but it really is true. It is such a blessing to be able to sit down and mull over and meditate and study a passage that has greatly impacted me, and then to be able to bring it before all of you this morning as part of our time of worship, and to worship and glorify God together by extolling Him through this passage, and by, it's my prayer to have it impact you in the same way that it impacted me, if not by His grace, even better. So if you got the email, you saw that our verse today is from the Song of Solomon, maybe an unusual book for us to preach from. I'll tell you why I I preach from this book. We're uh, we're in between series right now, and typically when we're trying to decide what book we're going to work through next, that's a good time for us to to take a moment and, and preach on certain topics that we feel like would be most pertinent to the church. And so in my conversation with the pastors, they didn't say there was anything specific that they wanted me to preach on. So they just asked me to, to preach on, on a passage that was really impactful for me. And this verse that we're going to be looking at this morning, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15, really struck me in my personal reading. You know one of the things that, that I long for most in this life? I pray it's one of the, the things that you long for most too. And it's this, it's to have a truly intimate love relationship with God. One of the things I want most is to truly be in love with Christ, to be madly, head over heels, obsessively in love with my Lord and Savior. That's what I want, and that's what he's created me for, and that's what he's created you for. And if he saved you, he saved you into this relationship. He saved you to have this with him as well. And so here I am, I'm sitting there going through my my morning reading, reading relationally, Right, as, we, as we do on Wednesdays. And this passage, I, I come across this passage in verse 15 of, of, second, of uh, Song of Solomon 2. 
and I hear it talking about our relationship with God, specifically in this case, man and woman, as a vineyard in bloom. And then we see here in this, in this song, in this poem, these foxes have come in and they've spoiled the vineyard. And I read that and I think, here's what I want. I want this vineyard in bloom. What is it that's come in and spoiled this for me? What are these foxes that have gotten in and how can I get rid of them? And so that's what I hope to share with you today. Now let me make this clear. We're going to be talking about this verse in the context of your relationship with God. But the Song of Solomon is first and foremost a book about human love. It's a book about the type of romantic love and sexual intimacy that exists between a man and a woman in marriage. And if you read through it, the book is a song. That's why it's called the Song of Songs. It's the best of the best of songs. And in verse 1, we find that it's a Song of Solomon. We don't know if that means that Solomon wrote it or if it was written in Solomon's honor and the legacy of Solomon. But either way, it's part of the wisdom tradition of Scripture. And what it is is it's love poetry. Now, this book, unfortunately, has been widely misinterpreted when it's tried to be read as something other than love poetry. But that's exactly what it is, and it's rich with beautiful imagery, and it extols the glory of the sexual intimacy that exists between a man and a woman. Likely, this book was written between around 960 to 931 B.C., and yet we have it today, and it's still just as much a beautiful picture of human love as ever. Now, while you can hear this teaching and glean much for your marriage, Today, I want to focus on how this principle applies to the even greater love relationship that you have with God himself. God repeatedly conveys in his word that marriage is a reflection of his love relationship for his people. That human marriage, human love and intimacy is a reflection of God's relationship with you, his church. We see this in passages like Ezekiel 16, Hosea chapters 1 through 3, uh, Ephesians 5, verses 21 through 33. I'll read a few verses for you just to kind of put this in, in perspective. From verse 28 of Ephesians 5, we read, In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. And then Paul actually quotes Genesis 2, 24 here. He says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. He's talking about marriage as a mirror of the relationship, the intimate love relationship that we have with God himself, specifically with Christ. And of course, what we see from Scripture is that unlike your spouse, Christ is the perfect spouse. Christ is the spouse that you've always wanted, that you've ever dreamed of. And we're called to be more intimate with him and more in love with him than we are with anything else or anyone else in this life, even your own husband or wife. And what we see is that many of the truths about human intimacy are mirrors and reflected in the truths about our relationship with God. Now, we have to be careful because not everything that is true about marriage is true of your relationship with God, and we can't run around a book like the, the Song of Solomon and try and find direct parallels for everything. But I think that the teaching of this verse is certainly pertinent. If you don't have your Bibles open, please open to Song of Solomon chapter 2 right now. I want to set the context for us. Song of Solomon chapter 2. So as you know, the Song of Solomon is, is broken up into a series of exchanges between a man and a woman, a lover and the beloved. It's hard to break up this particular part of the book and define exactly who it is that's speaking, whether it's the lover or the beloved, but thankfully for the sake of this sermon and the verse we're looking at, it doesn't affect the interpretation of the verse too much. So read with me starting in verse 10, and the main thing I want you to take away from this is that everything is picture perfect. It sets it, it, sets it up in a, a beautiful scene for us, and then we arrive at our verse in verse 15. So starting in verse 10, please read along. My beloved spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one. Come with me. See, the winter is past. The rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit. 
The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. My dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the hiding places of the mountainside, show me your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. And then verse 15, our text for today. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards are vineyards that are in bloom. Now notice here, I hope you picked up that before we got to our verse in verse 15, there was nothing negative about this picture at all. In fact, this part in verse 15, the little foxes is the only negative element in this entire chunk of scripture. All we have here is a beautiful romance in view. And then this verse is positioned at the end of its description. It's positioned as the little problems that need to be dealt with in order to keep this beautiful romance and picture intact. And so the main point this morning, and this is it, if you get nothing out of the sermon today, I just, I pray you take away this one thing. It's this, that you must not allow anything to stop you from being in love with God. Let me repeat that one more time. You must not allow anything, big or small, to stop you from being in love with God. Whatever threatens the quality of your relationship with Him, get rid of it. And so our goal and our prayer this morning is that God would show us what our foxes are and by us grace that we would catch them. So we're going to do that by looking at three points. First, your vineyards in bloom, what it looks like to be in love with God. Second, the little foxes, what are the things that are threatening your intimacy with him? And then last but not least, three, how to catch them. So we have the vineyards in, in bloom, the little foxes, and how to catch them. So first, your vineyards in bloom. Falling in love with God is not unlike falling in love with, with a man or woman. And if you've had the experience of doing that, the experience with God is very similar if you simply subtract and take away that physical and sexual dimension. Get rid of that part of the experience, and falling in love with God is very much similar to the way it should be falling in love with a man or a woman. The exception is this. It should be even more intense. It should be even more deep. It should be even more great and more perfect than it is like to fall in love with a human being. Look at the verse with me in verse 15. At the very end of the text, we read what it is that this verse is talking about. It talks about this, quote, our vineyards that are in bloom. This is supposed to be a picture of being in love. Our vineyards that are in bloom. It's a metaphor for being in love. I want you to try and get this picture with me. I was thinking about putting up a, a picture up there, but for theological reasons, I think that preaching should be more about hearing the word, and so you're going to have to hear it, but I really want the picture to be in your head. Just, just think of this. Imagine a vineyard that you've seen, ideally one in real life. Perhaps if you've been to Napa, you may have seen some beautiful vineyards up there. But I want you to, to imagine the hills. You can even close your eyes if you want. I want you to see the trellises row after row after row, well-maintained, covered in green vines that are sprawling all over the trellises. On the vines, you have grapes that are, that are, are beginning to, to bloom if it's becoming ripe and it's in season. Perhaps... It's a, it's a time of the day when you see the dew still sparkling on the vines, and what you have is a, is a lush and a fragrant and a sweet field, a vineyard full of ripe fruit. That's the image I want, to have, I want you to have in your mind because that's the picture that God gives here of what it's like to be in love. Now, what are the, what are the grapes here? These purple fruits, these represent the produce of the vineyard. They're, they're what this vineyard puts out. Now, if we think of the vineyard as, as being in love, what's the fruit of being in love? What does it produce? Well, if you've been in love, you know that it produces a great deal of happiness. It produces excitement. It produces satisfaction and security and faithfulness. It produces intimacy. Love is the vineyard that we have here. Being in love is the vineyard. And the grapes, the fruit, show that it's in full bloom, that love's in its season. It's here for the fullest enjoyment. The vineyard, the love relationship has reached its culmination. It's the way it's supposed to be, and it's beautiful, and it's magical. So ask yourself this, what is it like to be in love with someone? How would you describe that? What is it like to be in love with someone? Because that's what we're talking about here in this text. What does a vineyard in bloom really look like in real life? What does it look like? 
Maybe think back to, to when your romance with your spouse was strongest. Perhaps that was when you guys first started dating. Or maybe within the first few years of marriage, you felt that romance to be most intense. I tried to sum up the, the experience for myself. And so I have this here. I have this written down. I'll read this to you and, and think in your hearts if this is congruent with your own experience of falling in love. So I have this. You know you're in love when you can't stop thinking about that person. They are the center of gravity in your mind. They are your first thought in morning and your last thought at night. They occupy your dreams. You're distracted by them. You long for their presence always, in good times and in bad. You can't wait to be with them again. You cry when they're gone. You're happiest when they're there. They are better, they are better than a best friend. They are your delight and excitement. They make everything else around you beautiful. All you want is to make them happy. You get them gifts and serve them. You're constantly trying to show your love for them. There's nothing you wouldn't do for them. You'd be happy to die for them. You're grieved to your core when you sin against them. All you want is them. Your love for them far surpasses your love for everyone and everything else. You feel like you were made for them. You can't imagine life without them. Somehow you feel like you can't love them more than you possibly do, and yet every day you love them more than you did the last. That's the description. That's the summary that I came up with to try and, and capture this experience, which I believe is ultimately impossible to capture. But I want you to do is now imagine that with God. Imagine your relationship with God being like that. Let me go through this description and rephrase it for you a little bit. You can't stop thinking about Christ. Christ is the center of gravity in your mind. God is your first thought in the morning and your last thought at night. He occupies your dreams. You're distracted by him. You long for his presence always in good times and bad. You can't wait to run to be with Christ again. You cry when you feel the lack of his presence. You're happiest when you can sense that he's there. He's better to you than a best friend. He is your great delight and excitement. He makes everything else around you beautiful. All you want is to make Jesus happy. You get him gifts and you serve him. You're constantly trying to show your love for him. There's nothing that you wouldn't do for Christ. You'd be happy to die for him. You're grieved to your core when you sin against him. All you want is Christ. Your love for him far surpasses your love for everyone and everything else, and you feel like you were made just for him. You can't imagine life without him. And somehow, somehow you feel like you can't love Christ more than you possibly do, and yet every single day you love him more than you did the last. Don't you long for that? Don't you want your relationship with God to be like that? Don't you want to be in love with him like that? I think that seeing our, our vineyard in bloom, trying to get a picture of this, of the way that it should look like for us, I think that's one of the biggest motivations for us to protect it. I think that's one of the biggest motivators for us to seek after that kind of relationship and to get rid of anything that threatens or endangers that beautiful and magnificent relationship of being in love with God. So as we wrap up this point, ask yourself this question, why is it not like that for you? You see the way it's supposed to be. Why does your life not look like that? Why does your relationship with God look so different than that? Maybe you're like me and you say that there was a time in your life where you felt like it was closer to that picture than it is now. There was a time when it felt like I was more in love with God, but now it's not that my relationship is necessarily bad with him, but it just it doesn't feel the same. It's not the same way. What happened? Why did your love grow cold? Why did the vineyard suddenly start to spoil? You know, I, I think that this is common in marriages too, even in the best of them. You know, when you're dating somebody and then when you first get married, you're in love and it's romantic and then even the best of marriages have a tendency to see that fire start to die slowly. And it's not that they don't love each other anymore. There's just something about the romance that starts to grow cold when a relationship goes from something special to something ordinary. And unfortunately, I think that that happens in our relationship with God all too often. You know, there's a verse in Scripture that always pricks me when I read it. And it's a very simple verse, Hebrews 10, 32. It says this, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light 
and when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Remember those earlier days. That verse pricks me every single time I read it. Because I think back to when Christ first saved me, I think about how amazing my love was for him at that time and how incredible our relationship with with him was and how I was willing to do so much for him. And now I look at it now and I see, gosh, what what happened? It's It's just not the same anymore. It's just not the same. Where did I go wrong? Surely it's not maturity. I think sometimes we have a tendency to sweep this under, oh, you're just more mature now, your relationship with God has grown. Don't make that mistake. Knowing God more does not make you love him less. But it should make you love him more instead. See, a mature lover doesn't let foxes come in and spoil the field. It's just the opposite. So hopefully you hear this and you see it so precious and you want it back because it is so, abu- so beautiful and so amazing. It's so right. This is what you were made for and this is the only romance that could satisfy y- your soul both now and forever. And so hopefully we hear this, remember the way it was and we long for that vineyard to bloom again. But maybe you're in a different category. Maybe you say, you know, my entire walk with Christ, I've never really felt like it's been this way before. I know that I'm saved, I know that I have faith in him, but I've never really felt in love with God. Maybe you're like that person that that you see in movies who's married to somebody that they don't really feel like they should be with and they're not really happy and there's not a whole lot of romance there in that relationship, but they stay married anyway. Maybe that's the way that you feel with God. If that's you, then hear this this morning. It's not too late to start. It's not too late to see the vineyards bloom. If you're saved, the fields are there. They just may not be in blossom. We need to find out what it is that's preventing that from happening. And by God's grace, remove that so that vineyard can blossom for you. Not only are you missing out on the greatest part of life if you're not in love with God, but you're actually sinning against God greatly. See, God demands nothing less than all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Deuteronomy chapter 6. He commands you to let this vineyard blossom, to give him everything that you have. Now, perhaps you're in the last category, and you say, I don't long for this at all. I hear about this relationship. I I see what it's like to be in love with God, but there's nothing really in me that longs for that. There's nothing really in me that wants that. In this case, the situation is clear. You're not saved. You're not saved. You don't just lack a relationship in bloom. You lack a love relationship at all. If you have this kind of relationship with God, there must be some kind of desire in your heart for you to love God deeply. If there's not that desire at all, friends, then you haven't been born again. The born-again heart, even if you even if you don't have that kind of being in love relationship with God, the born-again heart will at least want that. It'll at least long for that. So if you don't have any desire in your heart for that at all, then you don't know Christ. So even more foundational question, how do you get this vineyard if you don't have it? How does someone go from being estranged from God to being in love with God? Well, that's actually one of the, the main themes of the story of the Bible. That's the gospel. That's the good news. We look all the way back to the garden in Genesis, and we see that man was created to have an intimate love relationship with God. But what happened? We know from the story in Genesis chapter 3 that he lost that. He turned away from God. He turned inward towards himself. He sought himself and gave up his love for God and sacrificed that relationship. And from that point in time, all men after Adam and Eve are born at enmity with God. They are born at odds with God. They are born as sinners, and in our sin, we rebel against this God that we were created to love. We hate this God that we were created to love. We lie and we steal and we commit adultery in our hearts and we disobey him and we covet and we lust and all of these things that he commands us not to do, we do because we don't love him. And then what does God do? He ought to punish us. He ought to rid the earth of us. But instead, out of his great love and mercy, we find that he makes a way for us to get that vineyard back. He makes a way for us to go from from sinners and rebels against him to becoming his bride again, to becoming the people that he created us to be. 
We see the good news here in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. It's the word of God. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have, be, it is by grace you have been saved. In his matchless love, this lover from heaven comes down and he takes the place of those who have rebelled against him. You deserve to die forever for your sins against God, but God, in his great love, which is totally undeserved to us, steps in our place and takes that wrath for us. He takes that wrath for us so that we can be forgiven and reconciled to him and brought into this perfect, intimate love relationship with him again. All sin removed and perfect love and righteousness restored. You want to know love? Jesus said in John 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Jesus, your heavenly lover, gave up everything for you. Gave up everything for you. And it wasn't because you are some kind of good person. And it wasn't because you are religiously faithful and went to church every Sunday and prayed and read your Bible. It was simply because he was gracious with you and he was pleased to do it. There is no greater love. My friends, there is no greater love than the love that exists between Christ and his church, between Jesus and his bride, not even in human marriage. And so we can sing as we just did in the song, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. To make a wretch, a wretch like you and me, his treasure. Not just his treasure, but his bride, his eternal bride. If you have not experienced this, the call is simple. Confess your sins to God, turn to him, trust alone in him. And instantaneously, that relationship is restored through Christ. If you have experienced this and you've repented and put your faith alone in Christ, then you cannot but fall madly in love with the one who loved you so much. And so truly, we'll sing as we will at the end of the service that God's love is so amazing and so divine that it demands your life and your soul and your all. That's what he calls you to. So in the first point, you see this vineyard in bloom. We know what it's like to be in love with God. That's what's at stake here. And that's all you should want. It's all you should want in this life. That's all you should want in the next life. And so let that compel you and motivate you to do whatever it takes to get those things out that have gotten in the way. Now what are those things? Let's take a look. Second point, the little foxes. We go back to the verse of chapter 2, verse 15. And we read, catch for us the foxes. Catch for us the fox. It's kind of an interesting animal, huh? There are some animals that nobody likes. And you know, I actually had to think about this because a lot of the animals that we think nobody should like are now pets, and some people do like them. So I was originally putting snakes and spiders in this category, but people do have pets, snakes, and spiders, so maybe that's not an appropriate example anymore. But there are some animals that nobody likes. Things like raccoons, bed bugs, <laughs> bees, Rats, we don't have them as a pet at least. Termites, etc. You get the point. Some animals nobody likes. But I have a feeling most of us probably wouldn't initially put foxes in that category. Maybe it's because we don't live in Old Testament Israel. But I love this. We don't really need to consult a Bible commentary to know that foxes didn't have such a great connotation in the Bible. I love it when the Bible contains this kind of cultural and historical context for us within itself. In the Old Testament, foxes are mentioned in Judges 15. You remember the story of Samson? He went, gathered up 300 foxes, tied their tails together, put torches in them. They went through the fields, burned down the fields of the Philistines. Not a good reputation for the foxes. Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 4, God uses the same word, which likely means jackal there. It's a similar word in Hebrew. He uses that word to compare the false prophets of Israel to foxes wandering around in the ruins of the desert. Even in the New Testament, Jesus used the word fox with a negative connotation. You remember, he's approached by, by some men, and he, he, uh, in speaking of Herod, he says, go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. Jesus calls Herod a fox as a rebuke for his cunning, his craftiness. In other words, when we read about foxes here, this isn't like 
fantastic Mr. Fox. This is like the gopher that you have in your backyard that's burying holes underneath your lawn and is tearing out all of the beautiful grass. You know, many of you know the, the story of, of my dad and his lawn in the backyard or what used to be his lawn in the backyard. And uh, you can even say that his lawn was in bloom. We can use the same language as it was here. It was in bloom. It was beautiful. It was green. And then what happened? And the, then the gophers came. The gophers are what happened. They come and they bury holes in the ground. They dig out the roots. They, they, they dig out the roots. So the grass starts to collapse beneath itself. And if you know what happened with my dad, he tried everything. He set traps. He even had a pipe a tube going from his car, blowing into the gopher holes up at the top of the hill to try and poison them with gas. Eventually, he had to give up, and we put in AstroTurf, which, uh, which was not fun either. That was a lawn that was completely destroyed by these little, tiny, little, tiny gophers that got in and buried underneath and ruined everything. That's a lot like what these foxes are here in this passage. What are, these, what are the little gophers in your relationship with God? What are the things that have gotten in, gotten underneath, snuck into your yard, and they're ruining this vineyard? Now, I want you to, to notice an adjective here. There's only one adjective used to describe these foxes. Look at this. It says, the little foxes. Because sometimes it's the small things, the little things that get in the way, the things that are often overlooked, that can cause so much damage. They're subtle, they're small, they're crafty, and they can sneak into your vineyard and be so destructive in your relationship with God. What is it these little foxes do? It's pretty obvious from the verse. You can look at it again with me. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards. What do they do? These foxes ruin the vineyards. They're destructive. These foxes would get in to the vineyards and they would gnaw and break at the branches. They would crush the leaves. They'd dig holes underneath the vineyards so they'd damage the root system. And of course, they'd eat the grapes too. So they're damaging the vines and they're eating the grapes. They're spoiling the value of the vineyard. And not just the vineyard, but the vineyard that is in bloom, as the passage says. It's when a vineyard, that, when a vineyard is in full bloom is when it has the most to lose. And that's when it seems like these foxes come in and ruin everything. It's the same with your love relationship. Whether it's with marriage, or in this case, your marriage with God, it has the most to lose when it's at its best. These little things come in to damage your relationship, and they devour the fruit of your love. Remember that fruit again. They're stealing your joy. They're stealing your excitement. They're stealing your satisfaction, and your security, and your peace out of your relationship with God. All the fruits that we had talked about earlier. Now let me ask you this. Do you feel like that's happened to you? Do you feel like that's either happening to you now or has happened to you at some point in the past? I think all of us, all of us can at least identify with a period of time, most of us it's likely right now, where we feel like our relationship has been spoiled in some way. We feel like it's not as good as it should be. Or maybe not as good as it used to be. So what are the foxes? Well, Foxes are obviously those things, oftentimes those little things, that threaten or endanger your intimate love relationship with God. They dig holes in your blossoming vineyard and ruin this incredible relationship that you have. Now, the foxes, I think, are different for all of us. Some of us have the same foxes, but even if you have the same fox, it likely isn't harming you in the same way. Maybe the fox that damages my vineyard is not the same that damages yours. But I thought a lot about what these foxes are for myself this past week. I thought a lot about what they are for others. And as a, a small side note, many of these foxes I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you, they apply to marriage too. So you can kind of listen to that in the back of your mind. But here I really want to, for the sake of the sermon, think about your marriage with God in light of these little enemies we're facing. So I'm going to rattle these off. And as I go through them, consider your own vineyard and see which foxes you're, you find there. So take a second, bring your vineyard in view. I want you to imagine your relationship with God as it is today, the way it is right now. How would you describe that? Bring that vineyard in view. And then here are some of the species of foxes that may have gotten into your vineyard. So listen to this as I share some of these quickly. Look out for the fox of unfaithfulness. 
particularly to Scripture and prayer. 1 Timothy 4, 13, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. In Colossians 4, 2, devote yourselves to prayer. How many of us have so not been devoted to these two basic means of communion with God? We've wandered from our communion with Him, and as a result, our relationship has grown cold from not pursuing Him. And in large part, this is just due to our lack of effort, our lack of desire to exert ourselves. Many Christians have dwindled this way. Look out for the fox of battles with sin. Romans chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. So I find this law at work, Paul says. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Maybe you feel like you're stuck in the mire with a sin right now that you just can't get over, and that sin is standing in between you and having that intimate relationship with God you've always wanted. You feel that old sinful nature coming back to try and enslave you, how it takes away so much of the happiness and the joy of the relationship that you should have with God. Look out for the fox of busyness. Matthew chapter 6 Verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and what? All these things will be given to you as well. How much of the time do we spend seeking after other things? Maybe you've been caught up with all the other stuff of life, and that busyness has taken you away from this blossoming and blooming relationship with God that you ought to have. Look out for the fox of guilt. Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Doesn't guilt just steal your joy? When you're feeling guilty in a sense that a Christian should not feel guilt, it just takes away all of the happiness and the excitement and the satisfaction that you should have in God. He died to take that away from us, you know? Look out for the fox of works righteousness. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Stop trying to save yourself. Stop trying to justify yourself. It is so hard to be happy in your relationship with God if you feel like you need to earn his love constantly. It is so hard if you're constantly trying to judge the intimacy that is possible for you to have with God based on your life and on your actions and on your works. It's by grace you have been saved through faith, not a result of works. Look out for the fox of discouragement. Joshua 1, verse 9. Have I not commanded you, says God, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Maybe you're going through a hard time in your life. Maybe you're struggling with something in particular, and that struggle has gotten you discouraged, and that discouragement has estranged you from God. It's caused you to push away from him and you have suffered the loss of the joy and gladness that you ought to have in him. Look out for the fox of tiredness. Mark 14, verses 37 through 38, in the, Garden of Gethsemane, in, of, in the Garden of Gethsemane we read, Then he, Jesus, returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Tired eyes, exhaustion, makes it so hard to resist temptation, doesn't it? It makes it so hard to keep pursuing a romantic relationship with God when all you want to do is just sit down and watch TV because you feel too tired to do anything else. It's hard to care about others when you're tired. Look out for the fox of worldly wealth. As we saw from last week, we read in Matthew chapter 6, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and, and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Do not get carried away storing up treasures in this life that will not last. You're storing up treasures in the wrong place if you are. We also see that the money is the root of all kinds of evil in the Bible. This particular temptation has a tendency to attract us and to draw our attention away from God towards possessions in this life. Look out for the fox of idolatry. Your work, your family, your relationships, your ministry, your hobby, your health, things that you can take your eyes off of God to pursue something else instead, loving something else too much. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, God says, you shall have no other gods before me. As we saw from a reading Revelation this morning, what a devastating 
what a devastating condemnation it is to hear God say to us, you have forsaken your first love. You've replaced it with something else. Look out for the fox of having issues with the brother. We read in Matthew chapter 5 that if you are offering a gift, Jesus says at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. If you're at odds with someone in the body, that's impeding your worship with God. It could be impeding your relationship with him, a fox to look out for in your vineyard. Look out for the fox of worldly philosophy, Colossians chapter 2. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. There are so many of these out there today. I don't even have to name them for you. Naturalism, secularism, evolution, moral relativism, so many hollow philosophies pushed upon us every single day through virtually every source possible. And if any of these has grabbed a hold in your heart, it is likely to have begun spoiling your vineyard. In the church, look out for the fox of false teaching, 2 Peter 2, verse 1. But there are also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Sometimes it's a small turn away from the truth. It's that slow two degrees off that two years down the line, you look back and think, wow, how far have I come from this point? Look out for the fox of pride. James 4, verse 6, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. There's no room to exalt yourself and to love God most at the same time. Lift your eyes away from yourself and look to God. Look out for the fox of bad company. Bad friends, bad family. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Do not be misled, Paul says. Bad company corrupts good character. Yes, your parents are right. The people you spend time with really do have an influence on you. They really do. Your family and friends, ask yourself, are they pulling me away from God or are they drawing me near to him? Something to be careful of. It's the same with your marriage. Look out for the fox of doubt. James 1, verses 6 through 8, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. See, love requires certainty. Love requires a firm foundation. It requires an unmovable faith in God, both that he exists and that he's done everything that he promised. And if you struggle believing those things, your relationship with God will never be strong. Look out for the fox of anxiety and stress. Philippians 4, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Stress and anxiety can be such a distraction. If you're anxious about something, or you're stressed about something, it is so hard to focus on God and to enjoy Him and to delight in Him, how stress and anxiety just eats up the fruit of our vineyard. Look out for the fox of worry. Matthew 6, pretty similar. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, or what you will wear. It is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes. Yes, life is more than food, and it's more than clothes. It's about God. There's something greater to be caught up with in this life than all the little worries of your every single day. It's hard to enjoy him when you're so worried all the time. Look, Look out for the fox of distracting thoughts. This one is huge for me. Distracting thoughts. Hebrews 3, 1. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. Set your gaze on him. Do you have a cluttered mind? When you have time to think about things, does it go to every other topic in the world, movies, stories, family, uh, relationships, news, any other topic in the world other than God? Fix your gaze on him. One of the last but not least, look out for the fox of too much theology. What do I mean by this? Of course, it doesn't mean that you can study theology too much, but consider this verse, Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. Christ quotes this, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Great to study theology, but God doesn't want a head full of knowledge without a heart that truly knows him. He doesn't want you to 
to have your nose in books all the time without truly knowing him and loving him. It's the same trap of religion. You're not saved by, by uh, theology or rituals. That's not what God wants. He wants true love, not just head knowledge or religion. And lastly, look out for the fox of disobedience. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 37. God says, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. When you refuse to submit to God's laws, you are essentially stifling the Spirit's work within you. You're failing to exercise the love relationship that you have with God, and as a result of not exercising, you're letting that relationship crumble and weaken and die. So in short, there are a lot of foxes. That's 20 foxes, actually. And those are just the ones that I could think of. I'm sure there's many, many more. How can I try and simplify this for you? The problem is always with you. Amen. The problem is always with us. Now, in marriage counseling, one of the things that is extremely important to do is obviously first identify what the problem is, but then who's the source of this problem? And usually what you find is, is both partners are contributing to the problem in some way, but there's usually one person that's a bigger cause of the problem than the other. You want counseling for your relationship with God. The diagnosis is very easy. You are always the problem. God is perfect in this relationship. If there's issues, you only have to look one place within yourself. You'll find all the foxes and all the problems there. And God always stands ready with open arms for you to come back and to have the most intimate love relationship with him possible. I don't think it's by coincidence that you have foxes in your vineyard. These foxes are sent by the devil himself. They're sent by your own sinful nature. And they're sent by the world that you live in, which is enslaved to him. And they are all sent there for the same purpose, to spoil the beautiful relationship that you were designed and saved to have with God. So look at your life. Find the foxes in your vineyard. These foxes are thieves. And they're really thieves of the worst kind because they're taking that which is most precious and of greatest value. They're taking away from you the full enjoyment of being in love with God. And so the last point, how do we catch them? Hopefully you've seen some of these foxes in your vineyard. Now the real question is, how do we get them out? How do we get rid of these things? Well, that is the essential command of this verse, is it not? Catch for us the foxes, the text says. So you ready? Here's the Christian's guide to fox catching. Christian's guide to fox catching. That's catchy, isn't it? No, no pun intended. Christian's guide to fox catching. Ready? Step one, find the foxes. Step two, trap the foxes. And step, th and step three, fix the damage. So step one, you have to find them. Like any thief, you have to find them first. So we know what they look like now. We've seen examples of several. Some of you are probably saying too many examples. So how can you tell which ones have crept into your vineyard? I recommend using some, some good old tracking, right? Look at your vineyard. Take a good, hard look at your relationship with God and then compare it to the relationship with God that we described at the beginning, what it looks like to truly be in love with God. Compare those two things and ask yourself, here's the way it's supposed to be. What's missing from this picture in my life? What's missing here? I want you to look at the missing fruit, look at the broken branches, look at the broken leaves, and trace those little fox footprints all the way through the mud. And when you ask yourself, what's not there that should be? And then, why isn't it there? Right now, hopefully, ask yourself those two questions. What's not there that you feel like it should be? What's not there? And then why do you think that's not there? Now, whatever it is for you, Maybe you say, well, I just don't want to spend time with God like I know I would if I was truly in love with him. Or I don't get excited to be in his presence. I don't get excited to be around those who love him. Maybe you say, I don't think about him as much as I should. Or I don't want to spend my life serving him. Whatever it is, ask yourself, why is that a struggle for you? Why is that a struggle for you? If you still can't identify the little thoughts behind this, ask yourself this. When did I start struggling with this? Maybe there was a time in your relationship with God when it was much better than the way it is now, when this struggle that you see didn't exist in your life. Go back to that point. Ask yourself, when did this start? How did I get to this point? And if it's always been this way for you, 
you may want to consider whether you have a real relationship with God at all. That could very well be the case. Now, to make finding these little enemies even more difficult, we understand from Scripture that your heart is deceitfully wicked, which essentially means your sinful nature does not want you to find these foxes. So it can be very hard sometimes to identify what's spoiling your vineyard. You need help finding these foxes. You need help first and foremost from God. So get on your knees, beg him for that kind of relationship that you want, see what's not like that in your life, and ask him to open your eyes to whatever the problem is. So ask for God, pray, and also, the Bible tells us that he's given us one another. He's given us brothers and sisters to identify things in our lives that maybe we cannot see. So engage yourself, involve yourself in community. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today. So what? What's the purpose of this? So that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. It's so easy to be hardened by sin's deceitfulness when you're not surrounded by people who are willing to be honest and truthful with you and who love you and who love Christ as well. Step two, you need to find them first. Step two, trap them. This is really what it comes down to, I think, for me. What is the most effective fox trap? The most effective spiritual fox trap is truth. I really believe that it's truth, specifically the truth of God's word. Jesus said in his high priestly prayer in John 17, 17, what? Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. The truth of God's word subdues our unholiness. When we see the truth about these things that get in the way of our love for God, when we see the reality of their danger, when we see the true nature of our sin, when we see the preciousness of our vineyard and the forgiveness we have in Christ and the power he gives us to overcome it by transforming our hearts and the glory that it brings God when we do, that's when these foxes all of a sudden start to die and they no longer continue to spoil our vineyard. By the power of the Spirit, When we see these foxes as they truthfully are, and our relationship with God as it is, God uses that to make our hearts right towards them. He uses that to make us hate them and to love righteousness instead. And all of a sudden, all the desires behind these foxes you're you're struggling with begin to dwindle away, and your desire for God and righteousness starts to grow. For an example, let's say you struggle with the fox of busyness. You're consumed by your job or by your hobbies or by... Uh, family relationships or commitments in your life that leave no time for you to grow and foster and enjoy your relationship with God. If that's the case, then seeing in the truth of God's word that there is nothing more important than your relationship with God and that everything else in your life, the success of which is contingent on your relationship with God and the fact that you're in sin and disobeying God and harming all those around you by continuing to engage in those things at the expense of growing in your relationship with God, then all of a sudden that puts a different perspective on things, doesn't it? Your heart starts to begin to change. Now all of a a sudden these things that you're so committed to that are taking away all your time, you don't want as much. And now you start to want what you know is going to foster that which is most important, your love with God. Now oftentimes, especially if you've been tending this vineyard for a while, you believe the truth at least in here. You believe it in here, but you don't really believe it. You believe all these things about busyness, for example, but you don't really believe it in your heart so much so that it's willing to change your life. And so how do you get those truths deep inside you? It comes by increasing your trust in God, increasing your trust in the one who said these things. And the more you trust him, the more you start to believe all of these things that he said to be true. Remember the fox that ruined the original vineyard in the garden. How did he trap Eve? He trapped Eve with a lie. Had Eve simply believed the truth, had she clung to the truth of God's word that if you eat from that fruit, you will surely die, Eve, had she clung to that, her perfect vineyard and relationship with God, the blossoming vineyard, would have been preserved. But she didn't. She let in the fox of self-idolatry. She let the lie in. And then before she knew it, It's not only spoiled for her, it was spoiled for the rest of the human race. Truth would have kept it under control. It would have been effective. It's the same thing that Christ did when he was tempted by Satan in the desert. Remember, he's presented with all these foxes, so many things the devil presents to him to get in the way of his perfect love relationship with God. And what does Jesus say in response to all of these things? He says, it is written. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone. 
it is written, is Christ's foxtrap. And it's perfect, and it's effective. So make it yours. Saturate yourself in the word. Bathe in truth, and you will cleanse your vineyard of all the foxes that are there. Lastly, so we see, just to recap that, you need to find the foxes, you need to trap the foxes. Lastly, you need to fix the damage. You may be able to get all the foxes out, but it doesn't change the fact that now you have a spoiled vineyard still. Your relationship with God isn't the way it should be. You don't really feel in love with him. Maybe you got rid of your busyness, but still doesn't change the fact that the foxes have damaged your roots. And so you need to go in, fill those holes, reseed the soil, repair the vines, and continue to tend to that vineyard until the grapes start to blossom again. How do we do that in our relationship with God? How do we fall in love with him again? The answer to that one is very simple. We know from scripture, it's by seeking his face. You want to fall in love with God? Simply seek him. By pursuing a deeper intimacy with him and drawing near to him, God promises in his word, I love this promise so much, he says in James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will what? He will draw near to you. Guaranteed. You want God to draw near to him? Simply draw near to him. And so, I think the next question, obviously, is, is how do you draw near to God? He's given us several practical means to do that. Means of communion with him, speaking with him through prayer, him speaking to you through his word. We fellowship with God, particularly through scripture and prayer. And so go to those things. Know him personally. Seek his face. Seek to know him more. Draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. How does seeking him make you fall in love with him more? The more you see God and know him, the more you can't not fall in love with him. God is so perfectly lovely. He is so perfectly beautiful and glorious and amazing and wonderful and perfect in every possible way that the more you see him and the more you know him, the more your heart will fall head over heels in love with him. I think it's similar to your relationship with your spouse. If you feel like your relationship is growing cold, you should take her out on a date. You should plan that trip that you've always wanted for. You should go out and enjoy her again, see her again and know her again and fall in love with her again for all the same reasons that you did before. If your relationship with God has grown stale, seek his face anew. See him again, know him more, and the more you know him, the more you will love him. Saints, I pray that it will be your ambition to not just love God as much as you did before, but to love him more than you ever have before. Make that your ambition. Don't just try to get back to the way the vineyard was. Make the vineyard better than it's ever been in your life. And so in conclusion, I pray that you've seen what it looks like to have a vineyard in bloom. I pray that you see the foxes that are spoiling your vineyard. And by God's grace, I pray that we will do everything we can with all of our hearts to catch these foxes. You must not allow anything to stop you from being in love with God. All potential threats all obstacles and dangers to your relationship must be removed. Anything that's gotten in, get it out. And notice who we do this for in the verse. He says, catch for us the foxes. Catch them for us. Do it for the both of you. Do it for yourself. Yes, it's what's best for you, but do it for God. It glorifies him to do this, and this is what he wants. He wants to have this relationship with you. So the worst thing that you can do is to just hear a sermon like this and do nothing. You're supposed to see that this relationship is too precious and beautiful to let the little foxes spoil. We can't be content with broken down vines and a fruitless vineyard. Don't settle for anything less than the greatest romance of your life with God. He tells you in his word that he wants everything. He says, love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. He's not satisfied with just having part of you. So go catch the foxes. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for giving us a beautiful picture of this teaching through marriage and through the Song of Solomon. Lord, we ask that you would truly cause us to fall in love with you. Lord, we ask that you would make it our heart's desire to love you not just as much as we did in the past, but more than we ever have before. And Lord, call, cause us to pursue that goal with a relentless vigor and zealousy 
to rid the vineyard of all foxes that have gotten in. Open up our eyes, Lord, to see what those foxes are in our life. Cause us, by your grace, to not only see them, but then to go and to trap them, to trap them with the truth of your word, and then to fix the damage that they've done to our beautiful vineyard by pursuing you and by seeking your face. Lord, this is so simple that you've called us to. Please cause us to see the preciousness of the incredible love relationship, romantic relationship, and intimacy that we can have with you. We're so thankful that you've even given us this vineyard through Christ. Lord, let us make the most of it for your glory and for our sakes as well. It's in your name. Amen.